The Middle East is on fire. The Iranian regime might fall. The longshoremen have shut down 36 U.S. ports and disrupted global shipping. And J.D. Vance destroyed Tim Walls with facts, logic, and charisma. We'll get to it. Okay, we'll get to it. But before we get to it, I want to make sure that a little teensy tiny story doesn't accidentally get swept under the rug. The ineligible voter scandal in Arizona, maybe you've heard about it, probably you haven't, unless you're watching this show, doubled yesterday. Now, this new data set, as they're calling it, brings the total number of people impacted to 218,000 instead of the 98,000 we first reported. These people were mistakenly marked as having provided documentary uh, proof of citizenship. And Arizona Voter Registration Database now has correctly flagged the impacted individuals. Election officials say they will contact the affected Arizonans with information regarding their status after the general election. That means for now, the Arizona Supreme Court's ruling is going to stay that impacted voters, that includes all of them, will still be able to vote. Oops. Oopsie daisy. I'll, I'll translate that rather um, euphemistic language. The Democrat-run government of Arizona was forced to admit yesterday, thanks to a public records request, that 218,000 people and counting are on the voter rolls illegally. Just in Arizona, 218,000 voters, one in 20 voters in a state that Joe Biden won in 2020 by roughly 10,000 votes, are illegally registered. The news media are reporting this as an accidental glitch in voter registrations. Oopsie daisy. But these hundreds of thousands of people in a crucial swing state that could decide the presidential election 20 times over, are illegally registered to vote. And the Arizona Supreme Court has ruled that they get to vote anyway. The media are already admitting that this supposed glitch could affect even more voters. And the craziest part, here's the craziest part of the whole thing. They only legally need to provide proof of citizenship to vote in state and local elections. These people specifically do not need to provide proof of citizenship to vote in federal elections. Given the scope of the problem that we are told does not exist, why do you think that might be? I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. The longshoremen go on strike. This could be the latest final big event to shake up the election. The head of the longshoremen union uh, is really making waves in part because he closed down 36 sports, in part because he is one of the most colorful mobster looking characters that we've seen in politics in a long time. We will talk about it. We will also talk about Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles. The big wireless carriers want to limit you to two choices when it comes to data, unlimited or unlimited. Both of those choices are ridiculously expensive. Stop overpaying for data you don't use. That's like paying for a pot of coffee when you only need a cup, which actually some hotels make you do, or filling your entire truck bed full of gas when you only need a tank. That's crazy. It would evaporate. With Pure Talk, my cell phone company, you can choose how much data you actually want and save. For just $35 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and 15 gigs of data, plus mobile hotspot on America's most dependable 5G network. Plus, when you switch your cell phone service to Pure Talk on a qualifying plan, you will get one year free of Daily Wire Plus Insider, which is a fabulous deal because you can also get Bent Key, Daily Wire's kids programming, which is absolutely fabulous. If you're a parent, you don't know what to show your kids. So you get access to the library of Daily Wire Plus movies, series, documentaries, Lady Ballers, What is a Woman, Mr. Burcham, Run, Hide, Fight, Uncensored, ad-free shows, one year free of our kids platform, Bent Key, and a free Leftist Tears Tumblr. The only way you get it is go to puretalk.com slash Knowles, or you can call, mention my name. Stop overpaying for your cell service, puretalk.com slash Knowles. Switch to a qualifying plan. Get one year free of Daily Wire Plus Insider. J.D. Vance destroyed Kamala Harris's running mate, Tim Walls, with facts, with logic, with charisma. 
Uh, it was an undisputed debate victory. It was on the points an undisputed debate victory. And when I say undisputed, I mean the New York Times admits it, the Washington Post admits it, CNN in its after debate analysis admitted JD won. I think there was a clear lack of preparation and execution here on Wall Street. I think actually it's the opposite. I think he had too much preparation. Maybe. Yeah. He had so many lines that he was clearly trying to say yeah. that he didn't listen and said when when uh, J.D. Vance said one of the many, many things he um, really hit Kamala Harris on, not Tim Walls, but Kamala Harris, he didn't respond because he clearly had things in his mind. I think the lack of interviews that he has done with national media, with local media, it showed. He needed more reps. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, J.D. Vance is uh, much more uh, experienced at this. Okay, hold on. So they're all admitting, the two CNN ladies and the one CNN guy, Jake Tapper, they're all admitting J.D. Vance won. Clearly, Tim Walls lost. Then you hear at the very end, Jake Tapper tries to make this excuse. He says, well, look, J.D. Vance is much more experienced at this. Excuse me? Tim Walls served in Congress for six terms. Tim Walls is the sitting governor of a state. Tim Walls is much older than J.D. Vance. He's been in politics much longer than J.D. Vance. He's been in national politics much longer than J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance got elected to the Senate like five minutes ago. J.D. Vance is not much more experienced at this than Tim Walls. Tim Walls is much more experienced than J.D. J.D. is just better. J.D. is more talented. He's better educated and more intelligent. He is uh, more correct, most importantly. He's just better at it on every point. When I say J.D. destroyed Tim Walls, I don't just mean issue for issue, question for question. I mean, he destroyed Tim Walls on the very purpose of the debate. And he destroyed the format of the debate, which was rigged against J.D., most clearly highlighted when J.D. called out the moderators. He fact-checked the moderators for attempting to fact-check him. Just to clarify for our viewers, Springfield, Ohio, does have a large number of Haitian migrants who have legal status Temporary protected status. Well, Mar 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 Nora, but, but thank you, no, Senator. No, we have no, no, so course. much to get to. Mar Margaret, thank I, I think you, it's important the, because we're going to turn out of the, the debate, economy. Thank Margaret, you, Margaret. The, the, the rules were that the you economy, guys weren't going to fact check, and since you're fact checking me, I think it's important to say what's actually going on. So there's an application called Let's the go. CBP One app, where you can go on as an illegal migrant, apply for asylum, or apply for parole, and be granted legal status at the wave of a Kamala Harris open border wand. That is not a person coming in, applying for a green card and waiting for 10 years. That Thank is you, the Senator. facilitation of illegal immigration, Margaret, by Thank our you, own Senator, leadership. Thank you, Senator, for describing the legal and process. And Kamala, Kamala, we and have Kamala so Harris much to get to, that Senator. Pathway. Those we laws have, so have been much. on the book since 1990. Thank you, gentlemen. The, the, the we want to have... app has not been on the books since 1990. It's something that Kamala Harris created. And then they cut his microphone. Gentlemen, you're... The audience can't hear you because your mics are cut. Masterful from J.D. I mean, this was the moment he, without question, won the debate. Walls could never come back from this. The moderators could never come back from this. Because J.D. comes out there. He gives an answer, which I didn't even play. But he gives a good answer on immigration and, and the, the program by Kamala Harris to import hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, really, ultimately, uh, into the country. And... The moderator then comes in and she goes, uh, yeah, but uh, actually, you know, super duper fact check, 25 Pinocchios, actually, uh, it's totally cool and fine, uh, and JD won't take it. He says, well, um, hold on, uh, what you just said isn't quite true, and, here's, and she's trying to cut him off, and she's trying to talk over him, and then he says, calmly, but clearly, he says, the rules were that there wouldn't be any fact checks. So since you're breaking the rules of the debate, I'm just going to explain to you what you are not telling the viewers. And she shuts up because she realizes she's been called out in a way that is clear and persuasive. JD was obviously in the right here. The moderators were obviously violating the rules of the debate. They were trying to rig it for Tim Walz, who at that point was already floundering. And it was going so poorly for both the moderators and Tim Walls, that they had to cut JD's microphone. Because Walls tries to jump in, now they're trying to go three on one, and, and JD corrects Tim Walls. He says, no, actually that law hasn't been on the book since the 90s. And because he has such a crystal clear command of the facts, then Walls starts going down again, 
and they have to cut his microphone. Horrible look for the network. Horrible look for JD for Tim Walls. Marvelous look for JD Vans. Then JD, and this I think was such a key. Not only did he get that exchange right, but he recovered. A lot of debaters would be rattled by that. It would shift the energy of the debate. It would make a, a debater get angrier, get snarkier, but be more on the defensive. That isn't what happened. JD just, he won the exchange. He immediately reset. And he had some really, really marvelous uh, lines, just positive um, explanations of where the Trump Vance ticket stands pithy ways of explaining why Americans will do better in a Trump-Vance administration. They were wrong about the idea that if we made America less self-reliant, less productive in our own nation, that it would somehow make us better off. And they were wrong about it. And for the first time in a generation, Donald Trump had the wisdom and the courage to say to that bipartisan consensus, we're not doing it anymore. We're bringing American manufacturing back. We're unleashing American energy. We're going to make more of our own stuff. And this isn't just an economic issue. I mean, I've got three beautiful little kids at home, seven, four, and two, and I, I love them very much. And I hope they're in bed right now. But look, so many of the drugs, the pharmaceuticals that we put in the body of our children are manufactured by nations that hate us. This has to stop. And we're not going to stop it by listening to experts. We're going to stop it by listening to common sense wisdom, which is what Donald Trump governed on. An amazing flip. Walls was trying to hammer JD and say, you don't listen to the experts. You're a big dummy. You guys are ignorant. Well, I listen to the science and the experts and the geniuses and the experts. And JD comes out and he says, you know, the experts have been wrong about a lot. And he doesn't even just hit the most obvious ways in which the experts have been wrong recently, which would be say, they were wrong about how it spreads. They were wrong about how to cure. They were wrong. They were wrong about the eff efficacy of the lockdowns, which people are angry about. That, that was easy. That was low-hanging fruit. J.D. went even deeper. He said, the experts told us that if we offshored all of our American jobs, all of our manufacturing, that would somehow be good for America, but it's been terrible. The experts have been wrong in a much deeper way than, than merely that which we've seen over the past three or four years. And that's why we're going to get back to common sense. This is some, uh, an insight from many great uh, political thinkers on the left and the right. I'm thinking even in this case of the Italian communist philosopher, very influential, Antonio Gramsci, who observed that if you want to have an effective political movement, you have to have the common sense of the people. When you become detached from the common sense of the people, your, your political movement's going to fail. And JD is honing in on that here. He says, look, you might have all your genius experts, but they've been wrong. And Americans with even a modicum of common sense were proven right. And that's what we're going to listen to. We're going to listen to common sense. That is a positive message. Doesn't matter what Wall says. Doesn't matter what the moderators say. Doesn't JD is speaking directly to the American people here. That is the animating thesis of the Trump campaign going back to 2016. He said it perfectly. Now, I want to talk to you briefly about the stakes for this election. And I want to talk to you about First Liberty. Go to supremecoup.com slash Knowles. The radical libs are plotting a Supreme Court coup, and they're not even trying to hide it anymore. These progressive ideologues want to eliminate the court's conservative majority by packing it with their own handpicked justices. It's not court reform. It's a blatant power grab to get the outcomes they want. If one party controls the House, Senate, and presidency come January, they could restructure the Supreme Court overnight. With a simple majority vote and a president's signature, their plan becomes reality. We've already seen this playbook, made up ethical attacks on judges, illegal protests at their homes, open threats from so-called legislators. It is Venezuela-style court packing, and it would spell the end of judicial independence and the rule of law as we know it. There's hope. First, Liberty is leading the charge to protect the Supreme Court from this radical plan. They're fighting to preserve the legitimacy of the court and the separation of powers that safeguards our freedoms. Do not let them Venezuela your United States. Go to supremecoup.com slash Knowles. That is supreme, C-O-U-P dot com slash Knowles. That's a French word, so it's sometimes difficult to spell for people who speak English. But it's supreme coup, C-O-U-P dot com slash Knowles to learn how you can help stop the left's takeover of the Supreme Court. Future of our country is in your hands. Check out supremecoup.com slash Knowles today. The worst moment for Walls in the debate was when the moderator called him out for 
of course, one of the least consequential of Walls' lies. Walls lies about his military service. Walls lies about his policies in office. Walls lies about all sorts of things. Now, the moderators knew in order to save face and appear to have any credibility at all, they had to call him out on some lie. So they called him out on, on a, a relatively inconsequential lie. Walls said that he happened to be in East Asia during the T Tiananmen Square protest against communism. And uh, that wasn't true. It, local newspapers proved that he was actually in America for that. So this should, this should have been a relatively easy answer, or at the very least, Walls should have been prepared for it. He totally dissembled. You said you were in Hong Kong during the deadly Tiananmen Square protests in the spring of 1989. But Minnesota Public Radio and other media outlets are reporting that you actually didn't travel to Asia until August of that year. Can you explain that discrepancy? Your yeah, well, and to the folks out there who didn't get at the top of this, look, I, uh, I grew up in small rural Nebraska, uh, <laughs> town of 400, town that you rode your bike with your buddies till the streetlights come on, and I'm proud of that service. I joined the National Guard at 17, <laughs> worked on family farms, and then I <laughs> used the GI Bill to become a teacher, passionate about it, a young teacher. I've tried to do the best I can, but I've not been perfect, and I'm a knucklehead at times. Governor, just to follow up on that, th the question was, can you explain the no, discrepancy? Just, all I said on this was, is I got there that summer and misspoke on this. So I, I will just, that's what I've said. So I was in <laughs> Hong Kong and China <laughs> during the democracy protest went in. And from that, I learned a lot of what needed to be in, in governance. Thank you, Governor. I'm a knucklehead sometimes. 100% fact check true. You know, hey, uh, Governor, you obviously lied about this really weird thing. Um, can you, why? Why did you do that? Well, I just want to be very clear. I grew up in Nebraska and rode my bicycle until the streetlights came on, and I'm very proud of that service. I rode my street, uh, the kind of town where you rode your street, your, your, your bicycles till the streetlights came on, and I'm very proud of that service. That is, that's a direct quote. What? And then he rambles. I cut out like 90 seconds of his response because I just don't have time to play it on the show. Good on the moderator for coming back and saying, okay, but I think really she was trying to help him out. Uh, you, do you have an answer? <laughs> do you, come on, you got any? That might, I don't know, maybe there, there was no helping him out at that point. And he says, huh, I, I don't know, I, I misspoke. No, yeah, you misspoke. You said something that wasn't true because you were deceiving people. You lied is what you did. That was the, I mean, he didn't even have an answer for it. Good grief, man. Then the most uh, absurd line of any debate that I've ever heard also came by way of Tim Walls. I've become friends with school shooters. I've seen it. Look, the NRA, I was an NRA guy for a long time. They used to teach gun safety. I'm of an age where my shotgun was in my car so I could pheasant hunt after football practice. Just as a general rule, this is a little advice to any would-be candidates out there. You should never, under any circumstances, declare during a debate that you are friends with school shooters. That, that uh, usually does not play well. The... Final observation I want to make on this, because this is where J.D. Vance is getting hit by some conservatives and right-wingers, I think unfairly and I think unwisely. J.D. Vance was asked about abortion. This is the probably the weakest area for Republicans, not philosophically or ethically, but electorally right now in October of the year of our Lord, 2024. And so they were going to hammer Vance on abortion and J.D. gave what is for a conservative Republican an uncharacteristically subtle and nuanced answer. First of all, Governor, I agree with you. Amber Thurman should still be alive. And there are a lot of people who should still be alive. And I certainly wish that she was. And maybe you're, you're free to disagree with me on this and explain this to me. But as I read the Minnesota law that you signed into, 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 into law, the statute that you signed into law, it says that a doctor 
who presides over an abortion where the baby survives. The doctor is under no obligation to provide life-saving care to a baby who survives a botched late-term abortion. That is, I think, that's whether you're true. pro-choice or pro-abortion, that is fundamentally barbaric. And that's why I use that word, Nora, is because some of what we've seen, do you want to force Catholic hospitals to perform abortions against their will? Because Kamala Harris has supported suing Catholic nuns uh, to violate their freedom of conscience. We can be a big and diverse country where we respect people's freedom of conscience and make the country more pro-baby and pro-family. Fabulous, fabulous answer here. He puts walls on his heels. He says, hey, you support late-term abortion, but he's doing it, notice he's being soft, he's being subtle, he's being kind, he's being empathetic. He says, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I've misinterpreted the law, but seems to me, I, a graduate of Yale Law School and a United States senator, uh, it seems to me, I'm reading the law here, my job is to write laws and read laws, seems to me you signed a law to remove the requirement that, that physicians provide uh, medical care to babies born alive who survive abortions. That, you know, governor, that just strikes me as barbaric. Earlier in his answer, J.D.'s really getting hit for this. He said, look, Republicans need to do a better job of winning people's trust on the abortion issue. Republicans need to do a better job, essentially, of communicating on the abortion issue. I know, I know people who have had abortions, and I know how difficult this is. And I understand that this is a big and diverse country, and California is going to have a different view on abortion than Ohio. And I understand. When asked why he's softened his rhetoric, he gave, I think, a sincere answer, certainly a persuasive answer. He says, because there have been ballot referenda that show you that this is a difficult issue for a lot of people. He even, when he was asked about family policy broadly, he said, look, we're, we're the party that supports growing families. We support mothers. We support fertility treatments. This is another issue. They, they wanted to hammer J.D. on a, a very nuanced specific issue like in vitro fertilization or something as opposed to IUI or other, you know, really getting in the weeds on all this. And J.D. speaks in this broad way without violating his principles, without violating his integrity. He speaks in this broad way about the broad policy, which is, yes, we want to be caring to people, and we want to have more babies, and we want to grow American families. He's going to be hit by the rock-ribbed right-wing, some rock-ribbed right-wing conservatives, not by me, but by some, for not pummeling walls on the abortion issue. I felt he did a good job there of pushing him on the late-term abortion issue, but is going, to, is going to be hit for not being belligerent enough on the pro-life cause. But we are called to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, okay? Doesn't do anybody any good. If this guy gets out there, guns a-blazing, and spouts off a bioethically and philosophically precise diatribe about abortion and then loses the election, doesn't do anybody any good. Maybe Maybe it makes people feel good in the moment, doesn't do any good, doesn't save one baby. J.D. Vance here defended life. He even, I think, spoke in a way that was bioethically unimpeachable on family policy more broadly, while still accomplishing his actual purpose at the debate. This was not a didactic exercise. The, the purpose of this was not to give some broad, precise treatise on bioethics and human dignity. The purpose of this debate was to win 5 to 7% of voters, specifically women voters, moderate women voters, in swing states so that he can win the election because the winners go to Washington and the losers go home. J.D. did that absolutely perfectly. We should not make immoral compromises where we lie, as the Democrats sometimes do, where we lie about our positions or where we uh, concede important issues like abortion, uh, important issues like the defense of the family. We shouldn't lie to do that. But it's, it's the difference between, as a friend of mine pointed out once, a diplomat friend of mine, it's the, it's the difference between speaking as a diplomat and speaking as a flatterer. A flatterer will lie to you to make you feel good. A diplomat will focus on the areas of commonality, and he will say true things, but he will focus on the true things that you both can agree on. That was JD's purpose last night. It was his purpose, as we could see, all the way down to the color of his tie, which is a soft color, a little bit of a pink color. He did it marvelously. He did his job. Uh, I, I don't think any Republican could ask more of his performance. Now, folks, speaking of 
facing off. My friend Megan Basham and I face off in the latest episode of Face Off. This is poor sportsmanship, Michael. I'm just saying. St. Augustine Church first. It has to be still a functioning church. It's still a functioning. Listen to this guy. Yeah, founded on September 8th, 1565. How you like that? When shadowy figures like George Soros infiltrate and attack evangelical churches, the appropriate response is to bash them. When fed liberals spy on Latin mass Catholic churchgoers, we bash them. And when French degenerates mock the Last Supper, we bash them. And someone who knows all about this is Megan Basham, who's been bashing them for years. Now, Michael Knowles and Megan both know all about bashing lives, but who knows more about religion? We'll find out. This is Face Off. Do you get it? Her name is Basham. That was the rhetorical stylings of Mr. Davies. You can catch that on the Michael Knowles YouTube channel right now. Moving on from the debate, a few other things going on in the world. You know how um, (laughs) Iran and Israel are at war right now? (laughs) I guess they've kind of broadly been at war for a long time, but uh, things have really heated up. Iran launched a ton of missiles into Israel. It would appear that there were no Israeli casualties. Oddly enough, it would appear that the only casualties were a Palestinian and some Iranians when one of them blew up. Uh, However, this does escalate the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, I think, look, this could could be very bad for America if Americans are pulled. If the war escalates, America will be pulled into the war because America is the global hegemon and Israel only exists because America protects Israel. If if the global hegemon ceased to protect Israel, things would get dicey real quick. So there is no world in which this war escalates and gets a little bit out of control and America is not more involved. It is it, That is simply what's going to happen. However, uh, what is strange about the incentives and disincentives here is it is good for Republicans if the war in the Middle East uh, is more in the news. Because, as I've said many times on the show, Israel is just a bad issue for Democrats, especially the cycle because the base hates Israel and the establishment donor class and the Americans broadly support Israel. So it's just a bad issue. It's not that Democrats need to find the perfect thing to say about Israel. It's that the more Israel is being discussed, the worse it is for Democrats. This, I think, was J.D. Vance's insight on the debate. His, his the reason I think he spoke in a soft and subtle and nuanced way about abortion is he understood rightly that right now, in the month of October, in the year of our Lord, 2024, the more abortion is discussed in the election, the worse it is for Republicans, no matter what it really is said. So, What is going to happen now in the Middle East? We will see. One good thing about having an effectively incapacitated president right now is that Benjamin Netanyahu is more or less going it alone. And no matter what you think about Bibi Netanyahu, you might think he's the greatest leader in the world. You might think he's a killer, terrible, awful person. I think you got to give the guy credit. He is extremely competent. He's extremely good at being the prime minister of Israel. And with an absence of American leadership, he's just gone in, he took out Hamas, he took out Hezbollah, he has really crippled the Iranians, he's, he's protected his country, he's, he's done a, a rather good job at it. So much so that the Iranian regime doesn't have very many more cards to play. And, and this gets to another little strange rhyme of history, which is that yesterday was not only this Iranian attack on Israel, it was the 100th birthday of Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was president when the Iranian revolution happened. In fact, he allowed and maybe even encouraged the Iranian revolution to happen. So this was when, uh, just before Carter leaves office, these mullahs, these Islamic fanatics in Iran, deposed the Shah of Iran, the the former monarch of Iran, who had been a good American ally. Shows you a weird coincidence of history. Jimmy Carter... (laughs) might live long enough to see the return of the Shah in in the form of the son of the man that Carter allowed to be deposed. That is how old Carter is. That is how persistent conflicts in history are. It would be pretty funny. And the Shah, for his part, or the would-be Shah, you know, Reza Pahlavi, did send out a tweet saying, the time is now, time for regime change, calling on the military 
uh, not to fight for the Iranian regime. Uh, he says, this is not a patriotic national war. Basically, <laughs> wait for me. <laughs> if you guys depose the mullahs, I'm coming back and it'll be great for everybody. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, a lot of people keep saying, this is it. Nothing's going to change anymore in the election. This is all oh, the first assassination attempt. That was the last thing that's going to change in the election. Oh, the swapping out of the candidates. Oh, well, the debate rather. That's the last thing. Oh, the swapping out of the Democrat nominee. That's the last thing. Oh, the second assassination. That's the last thing. I don't know. There've been a lot of last things that could change in this election. This is an extraordinarily dynamic election. We are now at, at what? The second day of October. This is we haven't even gotten to all of our October surprises yet. This is a live situation. Uh, however, whatever happens in the Middle East, almost certainly it will redound to the disadvantage of Democrats. Ask, just If you want to understand this whole extremely complex situation vis-a-vis American politics, just ask yourself, was the Middle East more peaceful or less peaceful under Trump? Was the world more peaceful or less peaceful under Trump? Under Trump, we had peace. That's it. Under Obama, we didn't have peace. Under George W. Bush, we didn't have peace. Certainly under Joe Biden, we didn't have peace. Under Trump, uniquely in this century, in this millennium, we had peace. You want to go back to that? I'd like to go back to that. Meanwhile, what's Kamala saying? Kamala comes out and articulates her unwavering support for Israel. I condemn this attack unequivocally. I'm clear-eyed. Iran is a destabilizing, dangerous force in the Middle East, and today's attack on Israel only further demonstrates that fact. Earlier today, I was in the Situation Room with President Biden and our national security team as we monitored the attack in real time and ensured that the protection of U.S. personnel in the region is paramount. I fully support President Biden's order for the U.S. military to shoot down Iranian missiles targeting Israel, just as we did in April. We are still assessing the impact, but initial indications are that Israel, with our assistance, was able to defeat this attack. Our joint defenses have been effective, and this operation and successful cooperation saved many innocent lives. As I have said, I will always ensure Israel has the ability to defend itself against Iran and Iran-backed terrorist militias. My commitment to the security of Israel is unwavering. Is the pro-Palestine movement going to vote for this lady? My support to Benjamin Netanyahu's government? The man, hold on, the pro-Palestine movement has been saying for months now that Bibi Netanyahu and the state of Israel have been slaughtering tens of thousands of innocent Palestinians, just slaughtering them senselessly. And now your standard bearer, Kamala Harris, says she she is giving her unwavering support to that man's administration, to that man's regime. Yeah, I guess they're a bunch of fakes. All those little kids with the kefias on the campuses, I guess they're a bunch of fakes because you're going to vote for this woman who gives her unwavering, you really going to do that? That's what I, that's what I want to hear from the Republicans <laughs> secretly, you know, in, in, on on the left wing networks, not in the right wing spaces, but on the far left spaces. That's what I want to hear for the next month and a half. I want the Democrats to be hoisted with their own petard. This is a bad issue for Democrats. And so whatever they do, if the, if the supposedly pro-Palestine people, and it's not just the kefia wearing kids on campus, it's Hollywood, it's rather elite people. Either they are complete hypocrites, they, they have to admit that they never gave a damn about a single Palestinian. They don't care. It's all performance theater because they're going to go support the woman who gives her unwavering support to Bibi Netanyahu. Or they can't vote for Kamala. I want those clips to be played. They don't need to be played in the mainstream spaces, but those those kind of clips need to be played on college campuses. Those kind of clips need to be played in Michigan with a significant Muslim population. Because the the response is going to be, well, Donald Trump is even more pro-Israel. Hey, say what you will about Donald Trump. 
and his perspective on alliances in the Middle East, Gaza existed when Trump was president, okay? So you're going to tell me you're this Kefia-wearing, pro-Palestine, I want a ceasefire, let the civilians live kind of protester. Did the Gazans do better under Trump or under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? And will Gazans and Palestinians do better under, under a second Trump administration or under a Harris-Walls administration? You know the answer. You know the answer. You just heard her say it. I give Bibi Netanyahu my full support. The same kind of support we're giving him right now that has redounded to the Middle East being lit on fire. Yes, Trump is, Trump is more pro-Israel. Trump is more uh, in favor of the traditional American alliance in the Middle East. But you know what? The Palestinians did a lot better under Trump too. Well, play, go play that in Michigan. Now, there are even more national crises occurring on, on the Biden-Harris watch, including the closure of 36 and counting U.S. ports. We'll get to that in just one second. First, though, we are 33 days away from the 2024 election. Now is the time to join Daily Wire Plus. Get 47% off with code FIGHT at dailywire.com slash subscribe. Daily Wire Plus gives you unlimited access to uncensored daily shows, free from ads or moderators. Stay informed with live breaking news coverage and hard-hitting investigative journalism that the libs won't show you. This deal is for a limited time. Do not wait. Join the fight now. Take advantage of 47% off new memberships. Dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code FIGHT for your exclusive discount. My favorite comment yesterday comes from you team who says, quote, broad-mindedness when it means indifference to right or wrong eventually ends in a hatred for what is right. Bishop Fulton Sheen, such a good point. Good thing to keep in mind. Stand in the middle of the road, you're going to get hit by a truck. There's really no such thing as neutrality on the big questions. So we turn to another national crisis that's cropped up, a really international crisis, I guess, on uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's watch. This is the longshoreman strike. This is the first longshoreman strike in 47 years, almost half a century, of course, taking place on their watch. Uh, the head of that union, Harold Daggett, has uh, gone viral over the past 24 hours for some statements he's made about the strike, about the impact that the strike will have, which he knows it will have, and also just for his demeanor and personality. Uh, the longshoremen have had a longstanding alleged association with a certain Italian-American subculture. Uh, some would call it the mafia, <laughs> gangsters, goes back to on the waterfront, okay? Uh, so if you want to understand the personality of the head of the Longshoreman Union, I would say just imagine the love child of Archie Bunker and Tony Soprano. These people today don't know what a shrike is. Right. When my men hit the streets from Maine to Texas, every single port a lockdown. You know what's going to happen? I'll tell you. First week, be all over the news every night, boom, boom. Second week, guys who sell cars can't sell cars because the cars ain't coming in off the ships. They get laid off. Third week, malls start closing down. They can't get the goods from China. They can't sell clothes. They can't do this. Everything in the United States comes on a ship. They go out of business. Construction workers get laid off because the materials aren't coming in. The steel's not coming in. The lumber's not coming in. They lose their job. Everybody's hating the longshoremen now because now they realize how important our jobs are. You're better off sitting down and let's get a contract and let's move on with this world. And in today's world, I'll cripple you. I will cripple you, and you have no idea what that means. Nobody does. I cripple you. I want you going to try to undermine the union. I want your family dead. I want your house burned to the ground. <laughs> this guy, he's a tough guy. He's, he is a mobster, okay, allegedly. He is allegedly a mobster, and when he's been brought up on mobster charges, uh, a co-defendant's uh, one co-defendant in particular was found rotting in the trunk of a car, okay? <laughs> these, these are hardcore guys. This guy is not messing around, okay? Now, the federal government could use the uh, Taft-Hartley to force these guys to go back to work for a cooling-off period. And, and they could do that, and the cooling-off period would last several months, just about. 
Uh, but he's prepared for this. This guy has, as, as he stated here, has gamed out how this all works. And so what's the effect of this going to be? Well, the effect of it is going to be, it's, if, this, if this strike goes on long enough, and I'm not even talking about two, I'm talking about three weeks. If this strike goes on three weeks, you're going to have trouble getting your Christmas presents in time. Okay, for every one day this goes on, it's going to take four to five days perhaps to recover. This is a, a little side point too. If you want to get Mayflower cigars, if you want to get these delicious Mayflower cigars or Mayflower cigar products, you have to order them right now. I say this because we use these ports. These are, we're shipping from Nicaragua. So we, these are the ports we use. They are closed. The supply we have in America is the supply we've got. If this strike goes on for a long time, you're not going to get your cigars. So I would just strongly recommend, this is just a little bit of, little bit of a word to the wise. Uh, we certainly are going to sell out of this supply, but if you want it now for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, whatever, order it now because that mobster means business. Uh, broadly for the U.S. economy, this is going to cause a lot of problems. These supply chains are re- relatively fragile things. I mean, think, of, think about the shipment of meat, just to use one example. All of the waste that's going to occur because there are not places to store these kinds of materials, some of which go bad. This is really, really tough for the American economy, and it's really, really tough for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Now, Ben Shapiro suggested on the show last night, maybe this is all a setup. Maybe this is a way to give Biden and Harris a win, that, that Harris comes out and negotiates a deal, and it was all just a setup. You know, we know that this guy, is, the longshoremen are broadly supportive of the Democrats. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe, could be, I'm not putting it past him. Or maybe this guy's just a mobster who sees some weak points and wants to get more money for himself. He's loaded. And also downstream some more money for his workers, which is of secondary concern usually to union leaders. But in any case, maybe he just sees a weak point. Maybe this is his opportunity to pounce. Maybe the the head of the Longshoremen Union is seeing exactly the same thing that America's enemies abroad are seeing, which is that America is weak right now. And America is weak because of our weak uh, and clueless leadership in the White House. Maybe what this really is, one, it, it, if people take the right lessons from this, it could really help Trump advance. But two, maybe this is a harbinger of things to come. If you elect this woman to another term, maybe two terms, who knows, in the White House, you're going to get a lot more of this. It's not just going to be a war pops off in the Middle East. It's going to be your economy crumbles. It's going to be your national security is imperiled. It's going to be your border doesn't exist. It's going to be that tough guys take advantage of Americans. Now, speaking of workers, you remember, there was a story I mentioned on the show, I think a couple days ago, that eight foreigners looted in uh, properties that were flooded by Hurricane Irene. So, the, you know, this hurricane devastates North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee, part of Florida, parts of the Southeast. And there were eight migrant workers who were, or not Irene, Hurricane Helene, uh, who were uh, accused of, of looting. Initially, some reports said these, these guys were illegal aliens. They're not illegal aliens. There's an update to the story here. It's eight migrant workers. Now, I have one question for you, and it's going to help, I hope, to make sense of the migration issue. Does it make you feel better that the foreigners who looted victims of a once in a century natural disaster were here legally? They were here on legal worker programs. Does that make you feel better about what happened? Would it be worse if they had crossed the Rio Grande illegally? No, I don't think so. The Republican line on mass migration for the past 60 years has been that illegal immigration is bad, but legal immigration is good. We want much less illegal immigration. We want much more legal immigration. I don't know. I think the problem is the looting. I don't know. I think the problem more broadly is the lack of assimilation. I think the problem is the, the effect on the American worker I think the problem is the effect on housing prices. I think the problem is the cultural fracturing that comes about when you inject huge numbers of foreigners into a country that, that is already fraying 
and already cracking along fault lines. That's what I think the problem is. You know, it reminds me of the, the Norm MacDonald joke. He was, he was joking with Jerry Seinfeld. He said, he said people uh, tell me that the worst thing about Bill Cosby and his accusations, you know, that he, all these women, they say the worst part is the hypocrisy. But I don't think the worst part is the hypocrisy. I think it's the, the worst part is the... It's a, it's a really funny joke. It's incisive. It shows you how wrongly people can perceive things. I think that's the same thing here. I think, yes, breaking the laws of the country, that is bad. That's a, hypocrisy is a bad thing too. But really the problem with mass migration, with bringing tens of millions of people into a country and not assimilating them, it's the mass migration is the problem. That's the problem. No, if, if you have been just been devastated, your whole livelihood has been literally washed away by the rain, I don't think you're going to feel better that the guy who is further victimizing you is here on a temporary worker program thanks to the Biden-Harris administration. I, I think it's it, the fact that he's victimizing you, the fact that our country has been flooded cynically by Democrats who want to give away America's sovereignty, that's the problem. The, the, the explicit Kamala Walls desired policy, regardless of the legal technicalities, that's the problem. Today is Woke Wednesday. The rest of the show continues. Now, you do not want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, K-N-W-L-A-S, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Republicans are Nazis. You cannot separate yourselves from the bad white people. Growing up, I never thought much about race. It never really seemed to matter that much, at least not to me. Am I racist? I would really appreciate it if you left. I'm trying to learn. I'm on this journey. I'm going to sort this out. I need to go deeper undercover. They don't say I'm racist. Joining us now is Matt, certified DEI expert. Here's my certification. And what you're doing is you're stretching out of your whiteness. This is more for you in this field. Is America inherently racist? The word inherent is challenging there. I want to rename the George Washington Monument to the George Floyd Monument. America is racist to its bones. The so inherently. Yeah, this country is a piece of... White folks, white trash, white supremacy, white woman, white boy. Is there a black person around here? What's a black person right here? Does he not exist? Say I'm racist. Hi, Robin. Hi. What's your name? I'm Matt. I just had to ask who you are because you have to be careful. <laughs> Never be too careful. They gonna say you racist. In theaters now. Rated PG-13.